you know, you take the clamps off and the human blood comes into the pig kidney, turns this beautiful pink color. A successful and long-lasting pig kidney transplant is creating new possibilities for organ transplants. You can still climb stairs. You know, he can still run at his own speed. The groundbreaking gene therapy that's changing the fight against muscular dystrophy. And as school starts back up, a look at the resources to help students and parents deal with the stresses of the year. Welcome to Ion Health, where we focus on stories that affect your physical and mental well-being. I'm Michael George. We begin with the devastating wildfires on the Hawaiian island of Maui. More than 100 people have died, and that number keeps rising as search and rescue teams continue to comb through the disaster area. For the survivors, the road to recovery includes caring for their mental health as they grieve for the family, friends, and homes that have been lost. I'm just uh, holding a, a safe space and allowing them to cry, just being present for them. And Dana Lucio is a licensed care. crisis care counselor who flew in from Oahu to offer assistance. This is not something that their brains were prepared to understand, so it's definitely going to need a lot of support with the mental health side. Um, lots of potential anxiety, potential nightmares, potential um, panic attacks and stuff, so that's where the, the immediate therapy support is good, but also long-term care is going to be necessary for all ages, for everyone who's involved. And with schools starting back up, the Hawaii Department of Education says it's also offering in-person and telehealth counseling for students, family, and staff. Scientists at NASA say July was the hottest month on record. They found the average global temperature was more than two degrees above average. That follows a run of rising temperatures that goes back almost a decade. The last nine years are the warmest on record. And folks, Mother Nature is sending us a message. And that message is we better act now before it's too late to save our climate. Scientists say man-made greenhouse gas emissions are a big reason why temperatures keep rising. Uh, most people think of us as a space agency or an aeronautical research agency. We are also a climate agency. And why? Because we have all those assets up there that are taking very precise measurements of what is happening. The extreme heat this summer has caused hundreds of deaths in the U.S., according to the CDC. But experts say the exact number is hard to pin down because of the various ways individual counties identify heat-related deaths. Epidemiologist Christy L. Ebby says ultimately people need to be made more aware of the dangers associated with high temperatures. It's well known that the number of heat-related deaths are underreported. And you find that most of these deaths are not recorded as being due to the heat. About half are from cardiovascular causes. People, for example, dying of a heart attack who wouldn't have had a heart attack otherwise. Essentially, all heat-related deaths are preventable. People don't need to die from the heat. Even though summer is close to ending, NASA scientists say we may very well see the biggest impact of El Nino, which drives up global temperatures, at the beginning of next year. Two troubling new studies about the harm air pollution does to our bodies. Data from 116 countries shows that rising air pollution levels are linked to increased resistance from antibiotics. Researchers believe the air is a direct pathway for antibiotic-resistant bacteria, and controlling air pollution could lead to reduced deaths from infection. According to the CDC, antimicrobial resistance is responsible for about 35,000 deaths in the U.S. every year. Air pollution is also leading to a rise in dementia. According to University of Michigan researchers, bad air quality from wildfires and agriculture lead to increases of Alzheimer's disease and other kinds of dementia later in life. One analysis of the data suggests air pollution is leading to nearly 188,000 cases of dementia every year. The U.S. is seeing an increase in COVID cases. Hospitalization rates are up more than 14 percent in the most recent week surveyed by the CDC. And in a sign of what could be ahead, COVID has been found in a rising number of wastewater samples. The virus is usually detected in wastewater up to a week before people start testing positive. CBS News medical contributor Dr. Celine Gounder is editor-at-large for public health at KFF. 
She tells CBS Mornings the most vulnerable should make sure they're fully protected against the virus. People over 75, especially but the elderly in general, mm -hmm. uh, pregnant women, people who are immunocompromised, people who live in nursing homes. What about the kids? And the kids, a lot of kids haven't even gotten their first round of vaccination. Mm -hmm. So kids and infants really need to get their first round to protect them ahead of the fall. Drug makers like Moderna and Pfizer are expected to come out with vaccines this fall that are effective against the latest variant. Researchers are reporting an increase in cases of leprosy in the United States. Cases have more than doubled over the last decade in the southeast. Leprosy can take years for symptoms to develop, and treatment can last from 6 to 12 months and include a regimen of antibiotics. While health officials say the risk to people is low, many are taking precautions. Christian Benavides reports from Davie, Florida. Yamil Moya is being extra cautious at work these days. He's an armadillo trapper in Florida. You can see how jumpy they can get. The creatures in the south are carriers of the bacteria that can cause leprosy, what's known as Hansen's disease. We have more exposure to these animals than, than anybody else does. Our paper is not designed to sow fear. Dermatologists Dr. Charles Dunn and Dr. Rajiv Nathu authored this research letter to the CDC, citing that Central Florida accounted for 81% of leprosy cases reported in the state and nearly one out of five cases nationwide. In 2020, 159 cases of leprosy were reported across the U.S. We did notice a slight uptick in the last decade or so in the numbers reported in Florida. But again, low numbers, hard to catch, and majority of the population to have a immunity. Researchers reported on a recent case of a 54-year-old landscaper who had not traveled outside of Florida and had no contact with armadillos. Leprosy likes to involve the skin, but also the peripheral nerves. They hope to raise awareness about the disease, which is treatable and curable if caught early. There's this idea that it's a biblical disease. The fact is, is actually we've had annual cases of leprosy for a long time now. While the risk is low, the CDC recommends avoiding contact with armadillos. The best thing to do with that kind of problem is just get rid of them. Moya suggests leaving it up to the experts for your garden and your health. Cristian Benavides, CBS News, Davie, Florida. For more than a month, a pig kidney has been successfully functioning inside a human body. Surgeons at NYU Langone Health transplanted a genetically engineered kidney into the body of a 57-year-old man who's brain dead and being kept alive by a ventilator. The procedure was performed on July 14th, led by Dr. Robert Montgomery. You know, you take the clamps off and the human blood comes into the pig kidney, turns this beautiful pink color. Um, and then a couple of minutes later, urine starts squirting out of the ureter. It's crazy. You know, it, I, I, I never get tired of seeing that. Doctors say this is the longest period that a gene-edited pig kidney has functioned in a human. An average of 17 people die every day waiting for a transplant, and they hope this leads to a new supply of organs. I think it's given everybody a real renewed sense that this is going to be our reality in the future and it's going to be great. Previous xenotransplants failed because the immune system attacks the animal tissue. But now genetically modified pigs have organs that don't cause the same response. Originally researchers were only going to track the kidney's performance for one month, but decided to keep the trial going after seeing how well it functioned. So we're hoping that the decedent work is going to kind of supercharge things and get us to that point where, you know, the FDA feels that we've answered these questions and, and we're ready to, you know, do the, the first living human trials. And this is all being done with the family's permission. They say Maurice Miller loved helping others and now his name will live on forever in medical history. Suicide is at an all-time high in the U.S. Data from the CDC shows nearly 50,000 people died due to intentional self-harm in 2022. That's an average of 135 people a day. The total is up 2.6% from the previous year and surpasses the previous high set in 2018. The greatest increase for suicides compared to 2021 is among Americans 45 and older, while those 10 to 24 years old actually saw a decline in suicide rates. The only ethnic group that reported a decline was American Indian and Alaska Native people. A first-of-its-kind trial shows deep brain stimulation, or DBS, is safe and feasible for patients recovering from a stroke. 
Doctors with the Cleveland Clinic use DBS to target an area of the brain that controls voluntary movements, language, and sensory functions. Electrodes were surgically implanted into the cerebellum and were then controlled with a pacemaker-like device to deliver electrical pulses that helped restore motor function. It's the first time this type of stimulation has been tested on humans, and researchers say 9 out of 12 patients saw improvement. Italy and Spain may be on to something when it comes to living longer. Bradley Blackburn has details on a new study about the Mediterranean lifestyle. The health benefits of the Mediterranean diet are well known. Now new research shows adopting the whole Mediterranean lifestyle is associated with a lower risk of death. That means following a diet rich in fruits, vegetables, and whole grains, and limiting added salts and sugars, but also practicing other healthy habits like getting enough rest, engaging in physical activity, and spending time with friends. Researchers with Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health analyzed the habits of more than 110,000 adults and followed up nine years later. Those who followed the Mediterranean lifestyle had a 29% lower risk of all-cause mortality and a 28% lower risk of cancer mortality compared to those who didn't. The study category of physical activity, rest, and socializing with friends was most strongly associated with these lowered risks and was also linked with a lower risk of death from cardiovascular disease. Study participants were all from the UK. Evidence researchers say that you don't have to live in Italy, Spain, or Greece to enjoy the health benefits of the Mediterranean way of life. Bradley Blackburn, CBS News, New York. Coming up, tips on how students and parents can deal with the stress of going back to school and the dangers of the ocean from the tides to the sharks. Back to Eye on Health. Heading back to school can be stressful for children, especially if they found the previous school year to be challenging. Danya Backus has more on new resources available to help parents address these concerns before they turn into bigger problems. Fifth grader Sophia Schmidt has been dealing with anxiety since she was in kindergarten. Her mother Megan says it started affecting her behavior. Retreating from activities that she's always loved to do. Um, wanting to stay closer to myself and my husband. They say therapy helped address it, but once the pandemic hit, Sophia's fears of getting sick made it difficult for her to return to school. Even now, she feels anxious starting a new school year. What are some of the things that kind of worry you or make you a little nervous about going back to school? Um, meeting new people and also if my teacher's nice. According to a new survey, 71% of parents say something made the previous school year challenging for their child. Parents identified safety concerns, academics, bullying, and mental health concerns, as well as social connection as the top concerns that they saw their kids struggling with. Dr. Whitney Raglan Bignall is a pediatric psychologist and associate clinical director for On Our Sleeves, a movement for children's mental health. We have to start having conversations and start to see what they're thinking and feeling, how they thought last year went. To help facilitate those discussions, On Our Sleeves has created resources for parents, which include conversation starters. Megan and Sophia say they've helped. Um, I don't always know the right questions to get to the root. Some suitable questions to ask to try to get there has been very, very helpful. It helps a lot because like, I feel like I can get it off my mind and help me not worry. And feel less stress with the anticipation of the new school year. Danya back is CBS News, Los Angeles. For more on spotting and dealing with stress, I spoke with Dr. Jeffrey Borenstein. He's the president and CEO of the Brain and Behavior Research Foundation. Doctor, first off, thanks so much for joining us. And we're talking about stress. And the first thing I wanted to ask you is what are some signs of stress in our kids that parents or caregivers should be on the lookout for? It's such an important topic because often we take it for granted. We don't think that kids can really feel stress or feel anxiety, but we know that they can. So parents should look for changes in behavior, maybe a change in sleep pattern, change in how they eat, change in how they're just in general seem to feel. Parents know their kids, and if you see a change, 
it may be due to stress. It may be anxiety or depression, which kids can sometimes experience. Doctor, what can parents do to manage that stress? Well, first of all, I think being aware that it's occurring, that's number one. Number two is to ask the child to say, what's going on? How are you feeling? Are you feeling anxious, upset, worried? Whatever words are age appropriate for the child and ask them to talk about it. Communication is extremely important. And one way to do that is to have a routine of as much as possible, we're all busy, but as much as possible, have dinner together. And at dinner, have a conversation. Ask the child, how was your day? What went on today? And a one word answer isn't the answer. It needs to be a little bit more than that. I think taking that step over the long haul will make a very big difference in the lives of your children and the lives of your family. I know, Doctor, you have spoken a lot about overscheduling our kids, too many activities. How do we know what is too much in terms of extracurricular activities? I, I think that there's always a balance in terms of how we schedule our kids. So you want them engaged. You want them to do sports. You want them to do other extracurricular activities. You want them to do their homework, but also unscheduled time, some free time to just be kids to just enjoy oneself, that's important for adults and it's equally important for kids. Well, doctor, thank you so much for your time and your perspective, we appreciate it. My pleasure. Every summer, rip currents are a big concern for beachgoers. This year, at least 70 people have been killed after becoming trapped in a rip current, the majority in Florida. Christian Benavides reports from Deerfield Beach on what precautions you should take. Headquarters radio check. For millions of Americans, summer means hidden the beach. And if you're doing so in Deerfield Beach, Florida, you'll likely find Ocean Rescue Captain Mike Brown at one of the city's lifeguard towers. When we enter the water, we're going as hard and as fast as we can. He's personally handled countless rescues. More often than not, it's when an unsuspecting beachgoer gets caught in a rip current. Rip currents account for over 80% of rescues performed by surf lifeguards nationwide. Rip currents do not pull people underwater, but rather away from shore and can pull you out hundreds of yards. These currents can move pretty quickly, faster than even like an Olympic swimmer. The National Weather Service says never assume it's safe to swim just because it's nice outside like today. Rip currents often form in calm, sunny days. Experts say resist the urge to fight the rip current. Instead, swim out of the current in a direction following the shoreline or towards breaking waves. Draw attention to yourself if you are unable to reach the shore. But most importantly, swim where there are lifeguards present. The chance of death by drowning at a beach protected by lifeguards is 1 in 18 million. It's a stressful situation initially because someone is in trouble, but you're trained to do your job, remain calm. You can also spot rip currents out in the water. Look out for a difference in water color, a channel of churning choppy water, or a line of foam, seaweed, or debris moving toward the sea. Cristian Benavides, CBS News, Deerfield Beach, Florida. And another rare issue when swimming in the ocean, shark bites. But faced with an increased number of shark sightings, lifeguards and first responders in one New York beach town are learning what to do in an emergency. You have a puncture wound, for example. You want to be able to fill that with whatever gauze you have. Medical experts from NYU Langone led the training on New York's Long Island. They're teaching specific ways to apply tourniquets to deal with shark bites. The Stop the Bleed program comes on the heels of a severe shark bite earlier this month in nearby Rockaway Beach that sent a 65-year-old woman to the hospital. Learning here is going to translate to, to one of these men and women uh, saving a life. We want to make sure that everybody's as prepared for situations as they occur and that they have the knowledge and education to be of help to their fellow human. Officials say there have been a record number of shark sightings, more than 30 along the New York shoreline in the last two years. Still to come, teaching a computer how to read minds using an MRI machine and a revolutionary gene therapy giving some children new hope for a normal life.
Welcome back to Ion Health. Can artificial intelligence read our minds? Researchers from the National University of Singapore are trying to do just that with help from an MRI machine. Participants look at a series of images, including animals, food, and human activities. An artificial intelligence system reads their brain scans and creates a model for each individual, allowing it to know what images patients are thinking about the next time they're in the machine. And your brain activities will go into our AI translator, and this translator will translate your brain activities into a special language that a stable diffusion can understand. And then it will generate um, the images you are seeing at that point. Researchers say it'll be another five to ten years to really work out the mind reading aspect, but they hope it can be used for good, not evil, like helping people without speech communicate with others. 150 surgeries in five days. That's what a team of 32 volunteer medics from the U.S., Canada, and Portugal did in the Gaza Strip earlier this month. The goals of Phager Scientific were to train local doctors and to help reduce the wait list for people needing joint replacement operations. Most of them are using canes, they're in wheelchairs, they can't work, they're in pain and can't provide for their families. Our hope is to restore their function and in doing so restore their hope in the fact that they can be also active members of their families and their society. So the purpose is not doing the surgeries by, by themselves as much as it is training and building the local capabilities so they will also be a help in doing more surgeries as we as we progress so it's instead of giving them a fish rather than teach them how to fish the group also donated four million dollars worth of equipment a groundbreaking gene therapy is creating life-changing possibilities for children with the most common form of muscular dystrophy Bradley Blackburn explains the treatment which recently got FDA approval and what it's meant for one family when Connor Stoll's parents watch him at the playground, they see hope for his future. He wants to do a lot of things and we're like, okay, let's do it. Like you, you have that chance now. So it's really given us a lot of hope. Connor was five when he was diagnosed with Duchenne muscular dystrophy or DMD, the most common form of the genetic disease that causes progressive loss of muscle mass. We noticed that he was having difficulty running around. He couldn't quite catch up with his peers. Within months, he joined a clinical trial and became the first patient to receive a single infusion of a new gene therapy. Developed at Nationwide Children's Hospital, the treatment is designed to fix the mutation and slow the disease's progression. I have devoted my life to this. Connor's doctor, Jerry Mendel, saw his first Duchenne patient 50 years ago. He envisions one day using the gene therapy on newborns. If we can do that very early in the treatment, we can essentially rescue the muscle before it's severely damaged. So the breakthrough in this early group will have profound influence on the field. Five years after his infusion, Connor's parents say they've seen no regression. A lot of kids his age are losing ambulation and are in wheelchairs. He can still climb stairs. You know, he can still run at his own speed. Because the therapy is so new, Connor's parents don't know exactly what the future will bring. But it has already given him a childhood that once seemed impossible. Bradley Blackburn, CBS News, New York. Hope thanks to the miracle of modern medicine. That's all for this week's Eye on Health. I'm Michael George. Thanks for joining us.